And now, and we're going to start with Baron here. We are now into segment two, which we're going to talk about how to run Halloween Horror One-Shot, crafting the plot. I know a lot of people don't like the word plot, but in this case, we're going to go with it because you're doing a one-shot and you do have this narrative that's around the, uh, the Halloween and horror genre. So, Baron, how do you design a compelling and concise plot for a one-shot horror adventure how do you get it into well we know kevin does it now but how do you get it into the into a two four five hour format well and it it basically it's kind of what i said er, on the last segment of you know i know where point a is i know where they need to get to and then we just kind of meander until we get there uh but you know there are also when i'm running a one shot i tend to also find it i don't physically you know like kevin put a clock on the table but <laughs> they actually have to do things or else other things will happen so if they don't get to this point in enough time mm. like within a like within a day you know if they're not at the next town well zombies roll through that town and kill everybody and then now when the when they get there now they have a a entire town full of zombies that they have to fight you know whereas if they had gotten there earlier they could have killed the three or four zombies as they were shambling into the into the town and had saved the town so there there are i like to put like not necessarily it, basically the world has a timetable Oh, I but, love it because that's you know, how I write my campaigns. My campaigns yeah. are all based on timelines, so yeah, just these are just shorter timelines. I love it. Exactly, you know, and you know they they have a you know if they they're told hey, you have a week to reach the capital, to stop you know X Y Z from you know killing the king, uh, and you know becoming a you know eternal whore, you know because of the death of the king, and using that power, whatever. And, you know, basically they have to get to the places. Now they choose the speed that they go at, but there are consequences. And I think doing that really does uh, set that plot. And also, it, especially once they miss, especially if they miss one of the first ones, now they're thinking, okay, we need to, you know, be nothing but, you know, elbows and and heels of my feet to get there. And that's the thing that you also have to create that sense of urgency. So it, it, within that plot, if there's, if they don't have that urgency to go there, then, you know, they're, 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 they're going to, you know, uh, you know, have squirrel syndrome where, you know, like, like Doug, the dog from up. Yeah. My master put this around my neck squirrel. Exact same thing. Players are like that. They will squirrel a lot. But once you put that pressure of, especially if they know that there's a timeline, they, that, that will have them focus. And it's not necessarily a railroad, so to speak, but they have to beat the, basically they're playing a game more of beat the clock than, you know, I wouldn't the say the consequences guy. are a railroad. I mean, just like when I run my campaigns yeah. that are based on, well, again, I use the term timelines. I'm sure there's a real word for it. It's just what I've used for many years, where it's like, you can follow this timeline, this timeline, this timeline, you, whatever you do, but the world is going to keep moving on depending on what you react to. You literally can't react to everything. I don't think it's a railroad to just pick one and say, this is the one we're going to try to resolve, and hopefully the other stuff kind of works itself out. Uh, how do you incorporate uh, classic horror tropes without making the story feel cliche? I like to do more psychological things, you know, whereas, you know, and, and you know, I, I didn't mention this in the last one, but when we were talking about sounds, especially with zombies, you know, you got, got someone coming up there with a sword and they hack off, you know, a Splat. bunch of, X, uh, of XP and then the, the, you, you explain, yeah, as you... Your, your sword cuts into the flesh, it kind of sloughs off and makes a plop sound on the ground. And it just kind of it just kind of moves. It's kind of like a jello type thing. And then and then my favorite is when they 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 try to and if they accidentally walk on it, you know, it makes a 
sound. It, it, most people are like, oh, ooh, especially when you throw that in there. But, you know, and that that's how you can, you know, I, I like to do, a, like I said, I'm more of, I like to put in more of the psychological mm-hmm. where, you know, that not necessarily that they are, you know, for instance, zombies, not necessarily that they're like super smart, but they give you glimpses that they're not just dumb little, you know, walking around. You we'll know, have to it, talk it, to Kevin know. about Dead Rain for a minute when we get to him <laughs> <laughs> and his special zombies. Yeah. Uh, so, so I mean, you were saying something. One of the things that I remember one time, and it got, it actually got two girls. This is back when I was in the Air Force uh, to walk away from my table. This was not a Halloween one shot, but it was just part of it. Uh, they chopped into a zombie, and I said, "Yeah, as you pull out the sword, it feels a little heavy." And I don't remember the exact words I used. And and you just see this viscera and goo at the edge of it, and she's like, "That's gross." She's like, "I touch it, <laughs> it's okay." So she touches it, and I just disca- I described like it's like a wet sponge slime. She's like, "Okay, nope, this is too much for me." And she got out, just walked <laughs> out. So, but but using uh, using concepts like that, absolutely. If you've got somebody who has a, a decent imagination, you can build up so much with that. And I have a super chat here. So Law Dog, thank you for the 1999, sir. No way to avoid classic horror tropes, but they're classic for a reason. They work. Lean into them. You know what? I want to disagree with you up front, but I think you're right. I think you're right. So, but they appreciate the the super chat, Law Dog. We're going to bounce up to Lord Mattias up there. Uh, same a primary question for you: How do you design a compelling and concise plot for a one-shot horror adventure? Well, uh, like I mentioned earlier, The Onion, I think that's a good spot to sort of start. Like, whether it's Eldritch Horror, have that thing you want them to figure out or at least head towards and then just sort of build on top of it. Kind of do it in reverse uh, compared to other, I guess, adventure uh, design uh, techniques. And then um, as far as I like to use the idea of timers and consequences and um, and maybe even almost like... Um, fourth edition D D had like these uh uh skill challenges where you had to do like three out of five successes to get to the next thing unlock mm-hmm. the door do something like that to kind of like move the uh uh cue the players along that they they have this like thing that they got to get to to peel back the first onion and then there's this next set um but to do that you got to seed information and if the uh if you got the mood right and the players are like like i said they're you know they're bought in and like like whether they're playing some insurance adjuster investigating a boat accident off the coast of maine uh you know they're involved and then all of a sudden like wait a minute there's scratches on the boat okay what does this mean you know and then they start peeling back that onion um uh, sometimes don't ask the question just go (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but I do think uh, there's nothing wrong with leaning into hor- leaning into horror tropes. That's why I appreciate Law Dog's comment because sometimes, like, I don't feel like running Call of Cthulhu and do something like that intense. Sometimes it's just, hey guys, if we're gonna do some psychopath stuff and there's gonna be a bloodbath and whoever wins, whoever survives wins the night. You know, you get bragging rights or something. You know, um, and I, that's just as much fun. Make sure you have a cool monster or whatever with a history that. Uh, the players can learn about because that'll add to and i think kevin you said something about this earlier it'll add to the mystery and the 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 intensity and the fear of that creature when they start realizing wait a minute what kind of powers does this thing have you know uh where did it come from you know um i think a lot of that can help uh craft uh the experience and the plot um well, but, what about this? Uh, and 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 I'm, uh, pardon me for interrupting, but like I use Ravenloft a lot as an example, and I have like the von Richten's guides. And one of the things I love about Ravenloft, anybody who's watched this stream for any length of time knows what I'm about to say, because I've said it a hundred times. I love how Ravenloft kept the the primary tropes, but like instead of the vampires drinking blood, you could uh, design a vampire that spinal taps you, that drinks your eyeball juice, that uh, you know just does other gross stuff, right? Uh, so. It's something that you can do, in my mind, to players like, oh, it's a vampire. Okay, get the garlic, get this, get that. Have have a different way that it actually harms the people, but it's still just a vampire. It still does the vampire stuff. It just does it a different way. 
Yeah. Well, I think it's also like it can be uh, almost like reskinning it. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 there was a Call of Cthulhu Grindhouse uh, adventure that I picked up from uh, Miskatonic University. Uh, I cannot remember what it was called, but it basically took place in a goth club. And it was there was vampires in the goth club, and of it course. was yeah, well, yeah. I mean, but it's that trope. But you, every no one really knew what was coming. They were just investigating something at a goth club, and then all of a sudden, they the the, the kids dancing on the edge of the the sta- uh, of the, the the pit, I guess, all of a sudden started jumping on people and biting them. They're like, oh crap, we're in the middle of a <laughs> vampire den, you know. Um, but there was one, but you could also. Um, play around with those tropes too like i one of my more infamous uh one shots with call of cthulhu is i wanted to do a werewolf story but i didn't want to use werewolves so i set it in an abandoned insane asylum where uh, that had like burned down and uh, some of the inmates had escaped and they kind of lived there still and they thought they were uh, werewolves so whenever there was a full moon they go out and eat people (laughs) and uh the and what the players were, I I made up. They were all part of a movie crew that were there to s- s- film a pilot for one of these uh, ghost hunting shows. And then ghost spacers. <laughs> yeah, I, I that's basically what I did, and um, it was hilarious. Um, and to this day, they still talk about it because at one point they honestly thought they were fight facing vampires until they saw a naked dude eating the face off of somebody else. But that's a story for another time. <laughs> oh, that's cool. No, that, that, that's cool. But, but I, I like that even without spoiling all, all, all the secrets and so forth, and we will get into some of this later as well, I like the fact that you're showing how to use the commonalities that we all have and, you know, and reminding people you can actually use, I mean, Kevin said a word earlier that's probably going to get me, you know, <laughs> demonetized on YouTube, but I don't care uh, because, because it makes sense. You can have those tropes. You can have those themes. You can have those kinds of evil people out there. For whatever reason, the word lunatic means something for a reason, whether it's real or not, but you can embellish that for Halloween. I know that as a teenager, I did some really weird crap on Halloween. I could no, I didn't eat anybody, but I did some really weird crap on Halloween. So, I mean, I can imagine that people are already not psychologically there, absolutely doing something like like that. Um, but yeah, so uh, you covered your follow-up, so we'll just jump down to Kevin down there. How do you design compelling and conci- uh, a compelling and concise plot for a one-shot horror adventure? Uh, well, in your notes for crafting a plot, you have save slash rescue, stop the monster or, or the horror, destroy the monster or horror. Those are all great, um, and I use them all. And, and as far as Law Dog mentioning, you know, tropes, there's nothing wrong, wrong with a trope, whether you mm-hmm. lean into it completely and, and you deliver exactly what they're expecting, like that can be super effective. Or whether you, you know, go towards a trope and then you just kind of give it a twist and it's not what they expected. That's always fun, as, as Lord Mateus has mentioned. Um you know, all of that works and, and playing into people's natural fears, uh, going for the psychology that, that, that Baron talked about. I I love that playing with, with the whole psychological elements. Um, those are all great, great advices. And I I do want to say, I don't always use a clock. That was just (laughs) one example of where I used the clock. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, you know, having some sense of urgency, uh, you have to rescue somebody, you know, just even pointing out, uh, classic, you know, detective thriller type things like, gee, you know, if you don't rescue the person in the first 24 hours, even with just conventional kidnappers and, 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 uh, sociopaths and, and serial killers, you know, after that first 24 hours, the odds of finding them alive uh, greatly reduced down dramatically. So, you know, you can play into to all of that. Uh, and, and you should because it's, it's fun and it works. I like red herrings and plot twists. Can you share an example of a plot twist or a red herring that you used in a Halloween one shot and the impact that it had on the game? I have a few, but 
because I still run the stuff. I can't. <laughs> that's I can't that's right. No, them. that's actually a very fair. Uh, yeah, I don't want spoilers here. So yeah, okay. um, I'm trying to think if there's something else. Well, how about this? Uh, what yeah, I love I love red herrings. I, I love red herrings and plot twists all the time. I mean, come on, you see it in my books, especially riffs, all the time. Where I re I love leading people down the path that are like, yeah, we're up against what the heck. <laughs> You know, I I because they think they know what they're going up against, and then suddenly it's like, whoa, those are great. Mm -hmm. All right, then I'll do this for all of you. This question, uh, everybody can jump in on this one. Uh, what are some key elements that every horror one shot plot should include to be effective? And obviously, this is opinion based, but uh, just, there, there, there's a key element that you got to do this, or you really like this uh, to be effective. And I don't care who starts. I'll start. Um, <laughs> what I said before is vulnerability. I think you really need to do that because um, to talk about the psychology issue that Baron brought up, um, we are still, like I said, one foot's in the world, the other foot is in the fantasy. And the foot that's in the world is a player who likes keeping track of the points and maximizing that character and figuring out how to beat the game. So if you keep them vulnerable, you keep them going, wait a minute, okay, well, I, I've, I have this plus two sword, and I got a plus two to my strength, and this thing is it, it, it's like incorporeal, so I can't hit it. What do I do? Like, you, you have to turn the tables on them and make them think outside the box, make them not be able to rely on the usual things that they, they would expect to rely on. So I think keep them vulnerable is something that is key. Um, uh, a good a good game mechanic. I'm, this won't give away to any uh, anything to anybody who has who's interested in running this. Uh, it's called Death Love Doom by James Raggi. It is not for the faint of heart, but it's got a great mechanic in it. Before the game even starts, everyone goes around the table and picks a number from one to eight. Everyone asks, "What is this for?" You don't say anything. All right. So now this they pick this number, whatever it is, and they and they could double up. They could all pick the same number. It doesn't matter. Well, the big bad rolls a D8 for damage. If it hits you and rolls your number, your number's up. You're dead. It does this horrible, nasty thing to you, and your character's oh, wow. just out. Your character is just out. And it's really gruesome, and James Raggi being James Raggi says, lean into it hard at that point. Um, I had a, uh, a cleric. He, his number was up. And what ended the, the players found him upside down in like the classic upside down crucifix, like bowels, his head was taken off, all that stuff. And um that that works great. Like everyone was like at first was like, oh shit. And then you know, the blood and the gore, and they kind of giggled, like, oh yeah, that was kind of cool, you know. But uh it they were they were that moment of intensity was there. So um keep them vulnerable, keep them guessing. Okay. Anybody else want to? Uh... Oops, I already scrolled past it. Uh, like an effective horror plot that you think needs to be. Well, I, I, I like what Lord Matea said. Um, I also think for me, but I, I'm sort of the master of, of monsters and villains. Uh, Eric Wojcik once told me, or more than once told me, that I created the greatest villains he's ever seen. And I said, well, you can attribute that to uh, George Lucas and Stan Lee. Uh, you know, I, I think having a villain you love to hate or, or a really strong or disgusting villain, that, that really helps enhance the story, especially when you succeed against it, because um, you really feel like you accomplished something uh, important. So I, I, I love really strong, charismatic or disgusting villains. Um, I think that that makes a big difference. And, and I just, I want to mention too, it's, it's not something you need in a horror uh, one shot or, or a campaign, but don't shy away from humor. I, I, especially when things get really tense or gory, if, if people, you know, make a joke and people laugh, that's cool. If you make a joke to lighten things up, because sometimes people need that. Um, that's why you see that in in various you know some of the best movies, uh, you have that element of of laughter. Uh, in fact, a, a great example of that is in uh, most of the Avenger movies and certainly in Guardian of the Galaxies, where for me it starts to get to the point of I don't know it's a little too 
jokey for me. But then when they hit that dramatic moment, they just pull it in and you're sitting there and tears are welling up in your eyes or, you know, you're sitting on the edge of your seat. Um, so don't be afraid to include some humor to lighten things up. Even if it's almost like you had mentioned, uh, you know, breaking the fourth wall. Even if, if it's kind of like an inside thing where, where someone does something, you make a joke about what one of the players did uh, and everyone laughs. It's okay because you just kind of broke that tension a little bit. There's got to be a time and a place for that, though. I, I I hear what you're saying. I want to agree to some extent, but I'm, I'm the type of person that I really hate it when somebody breaks tension with some sort of dumbass comment. It's like that was the, not the right time for this. You ruined everybody's immersion at this point. Um, but I but I generally get what you're saying. I, my favorite type of laughter in, in a, in a horror, like when I'm running my Raven laugh, is that uncomfortable laughter? Like, <laughs> What's going on right now? You know? All right, Baron, anything you want to share? Are we ready to move on? Uh, move on. Okay. <laughs> I got Not a problem. we got a couple of chats. We'll look at here real quickly. Um, apparently my wife is stalking me right now. She says I can make every day into horror uh, events. Ask Max. I have the timeline. He doesn't do things in time. His wife turns into a creature with weapons. She's, <laughs> she's Asian. It's bleach. I always <laughs> sniff my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Rondi Abadi says plot twist when the players realize that they are the monsters that's not bad <laughs> there's, a, there's a couple lamentations of the flame princess modules where that's exactly what you're doing uh, it's pretty gruesome but anyway <laughs> okay I well, recommend uh, was it uh, the daughter, curse of the daughter's brides that's the one I would recommend all right, we're going to start back at the top here uh, with Lord Mattias here. How do you ensure the plot progresses at the right pace, given the time constraints of a one-shot? Well, uh, I hate to say if you did it right, uh, they'll peel back the onions at the right time. But as Baron has been saying, you're kind of at the mercy of what your players are going to latch on to and make sure they're not getting all squirrely. Um, so I, at that point, I will have, like whether it's a, a monster thing, you know, where it's just a psychopath or mindless creature, whatever it is, or they're going up against a faction, a cult, they'll be still acting. And if, so if the players are not in the right, going in the right direction, something's going to happen. And like, I'll be dropping an extra clue down that I didn't intend to drop initially. You know, um, it's that um, Tracy Hickman kind of like bumping the players kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I'll, I'll make it so the monster's doing it. So, like, oh, the monster attacked again. You know, here's another chance for you guys to get the investigation right kind of thing. You know, um, I'll do stuff like that. Um, when I was doing the one of the more, call it Cthulhu-y ones, that the, the, there was a cult faction. And one of the guys was a lawyer. And so he started harassing uh, the players who were trying to investigate. And that, and that kind of clued them in, like, wait a minute is the cult leading the town yeah i was like yes they, they figured it out you know that's one layer peeled away now we can move on to the next phase of the the adventure so i think you i don't want i don't think it's fair to call it a railroad but i do think you uh need to be more active as a game master in, in a one shot because sure. um and, and that's only fair to the players because they bought their ticket right they want mm -hmm. that world Poster ride, so you got to make sure you got to take all your. If you know, if you're an OSR guy like myself, you got to take all that stuff and throw it out the window and just like, okay, this is this is what's happening today, and don't be afraid to do it to make sure things move along. You started down this uh, this, so I'm, I'm going to ask you this follow up here. Can you share an example when the pacing or what the players were doing became an issue and how you had to adjust what was going on to fix it? Oh, a great one. Okay, so I, this was like the last in this like trilogy of Cthulhu games I was running. So this was like after three years, every, you know, one every Halloween. Um, I was influenced by this old uh, television show called, I think it was called Night Terrors. Um, uh, um, oh, I can't remember who hosted it, but uh, there was this one awesome story where like the military went into the desert and there was like this cube and inside the cube is another dimension. And it looked like they were like in the 1800s or 1700s or whatever. 
and the character main character fell in love with a girl inside blah 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 anyway i i stole that idea and they were a military unit who had to investigate this thing but inside was my big bad who was going to use this cube to come into our world and uh i had i've, I've done this every time i would have a player playing one of the uh pre-gens kind of be my inside man kind of like where i'd nudge him a little bit be like hey you know do this thing so I had this one player who was a little too enthusiastic. And uh, he all of a sudden, in the middle of the game, just looks at me and goes, well, this is really freaky. My character's losing his mind. I turn to Eric and I shoot his character. I'm like, uh, what? And he's like, yeah, that's what I do. So I'm like, well, all my notes just went out the window. And then I played it out. I just played it out. And what ended up happening was the bad guy got out. And the entire military base ended up getting into a firefight with itself. <laughs> and if you think about it, that was actually more Cthulhu than what I had originally planned. Because, like, what's going to happen is the next team that goes in there is going to have to try to figure out why this military base ended up shooting itself. So, um, and, and that happened, I mean, I expected this guy to lose his mind at some point. But this happened like an hour and a half, two hours when I in a six hour session that we were planning for six hours. I was expecting it to go another two. So yeah, and so this turned into this went from like an investigated horror game to uh a shootout monster, like military guys are like foaming at the mouth, going crazy, seeing things, the players not sure who they're shooting at, they're sometimes shooting their friends. I totally off the cuff, but uh, we still ended up having a pretty success successful session. Well, there's something to be said about uh, zero prep and sandboxing right there, all in one. All right, uh, Kevin, same question for you. How do you ensure the plot progresses at the right pace given the time constraints of a one shot? And by the way, I'm just going to say for the record, you don't get to cheat and use a clock for this one. <laughs> 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 well, first of all, using a clock isn't a cheat. <laughs> touche, touche. It, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a really effective d device. Mm -hmm. But um, there are just lots of things you can do. Um, from uh, you know, there's kind of dragging their feet and not doing something. You can introduce an NPC who runs up and says, "Oh my God, you got to help me! My husband or my kid or whatever just got abducted or is under attack in in the in the alley," uh, and you know that gets a moving uh, pr pretty quick. Um, you know, you can have a creature or a minion suddenly make an appearance. Uh, and then uh, it starts to run away, and of course they they are likely to pursue it, um, and then that leads them to the big baddie or to the secret lair or whatever it is. Uh, I think the real trick is as a game master is to be flexible uh, and just kind of go with the flow and do what you got to do um, to keep things moving and to keep them happy. Like as you were, uh, Lord Mateus, as you were talking about that, that scenario and the guy pulling the gun and I'm going to shoot this other player, you know, the thing that came into my mind and maybe it's because we talked about alien a lot is that, you know, he's ready to shoot the other guy and then something comes down from the shadows from, from, from the rafters and grabs him and pulls him away and people are like what is that and there it is the big reveal again granted two hours earlier than you intended but it works and then whether it gets away and now they have to pursue it and they have an idea where it lives you know where it's hiding um you know because there's tunnels or god knows what secret doors or sewers or, or whatever um you know, those are all kind of things you can do to keep things, keep things rolling. In a modern horror game, maybe the authorities step in to do something, or uh, you know, while they're at the police station because the the, the authorities arrested them for questioning uh, a reporter. You know, once the questioning is all done and they're released, a reporter comes up or a witness comes up and says, "You know, the police won't let me talk about this, or I can't get proof," but here's this lead. I mean, sometimes uh, you do have to spoon feed <laughs> the, the, the players depending on uh, on the group or, or the situation, or maybe you're as the game master, you just not being clear enough 
Um, but yeah, anything that works to help move it along, do it. I'm a big fan of NPCs coming in to nudge or, or direct people and, and, you know, put them in the right direction. Game masters, when they're running a specific niche, like a Halloween horror one shot or a Christmas special or, or whatever it is that, that they're trying to do, oftentimes feel boxed in by that to some degree. At least that, that's, that's my terminology. So being flexible, the sandbox, the like you just said, you know, changing. Yeah, you brought the monster in two hours early, but, you know, it, it fit the scene. Let's dive into that just a touch more. So how do you use player actions and decisions to guide the flow without losing control of the suspense? Because somebody might look at what you say, and go, well, that just ruined the suspense because it's supposed to be revealed at the end that they weren't supposed to know X, Y, Z. I'm not Shyamalan, as somebody said earlier, or whatever, you know, something like that. But so how can you use their actions to maintain the suspense, even if you do have to release some information early or they figure something out sooner than you want them to? Well, the first thing is... Don't box yourself in. You're the one who's boxing yourself in because you're saying it's got to go this way. No, it can go a lot of different ways. I really love what, what, what Baron says because I, I tend to play the same way. I know how it's starting. I know where it's going to go for, for, for the big finale. How they get there doesn't really matter. And, and I kind of watch them and I'll play and I'll kind of feed them along uh, and, and help them have whatever fun they're going to get. But, you know, if if in the course of this game, it means I got to cut out this whole cool thing that I had originally planned because they've been dragging their feet or they went on some wild goose chase, <laughs> chasing a red heron, herring. Um, that's okay. It's all about them having fun and getting to point B. So you just kind of do whatever you have to do and, and don't sweat it. Don't feel cheated. Don't feel like they're getting cheated if something has to get cut out or you have to move something up or you have to make up something whole cloth uh, out of the blue. Uh, I mean, a great example is in, in one of my uh, Lord of Silka games. When, in fact, when I was running the original tournament when I first created it back in like 1982, um, I, I'm running like six groups and whoever, it, it was a tournament kind of thing. And, and whichever group played the best was getting some prize and the group that played the best was this regular group of players who, uh, you know, played every week, the same group. And they were like this well-oiled machine, man. They just, and, and talk about throwing you for a loop. The, the big bad guy was, was uh, uh, basically metamorphed. And one of the, one of the killer, one of, one of the players says, I'm not taking any chances and he was playing sort of this this uh, uh, anarchist character. So he said, when the rest of the group isn't looking, I, I, I'm going to kill this guy. He said, I'm like right behind him, right? I Can I just reach over and cut his throat? And, and again, it's like, well, yeah, you can try. And he rolled really well. And I'm like, yeah, you killed him. And I'm thinking, holy shit, he just killed Lord De Silka two minutes into the game. <laughs> What do I do now? I got a two-hour freaking tournament. And I sat back and went, well, you know, he killed this guy. He has no clue that it's Lord DeSilka. I just let him continue on with the game, trying to track down Lord DeSilka and, and stop the ritual. And it was pretty awesome because they were this well-oiled machine. They, like, went down into his dungeon lair, and they, like, cleaned it out they're clearing it out but they're like freaking out because time's running out we haven't found them yet and they're killing everything they run into because which they should i mean it's all demonic hideous terrible things and it gets down to the you know the clock runs out and it's like yeah it's like bong bong you know midnight you know bong and they're like oh no we're all going to hell hey what happened? Nothing. <laughs> you guys, and I explained what they did, and they're like, holy shit, that was great. <laughs> but, I mean, it's like the ultimate, what am I going to do now as a game master? I'm sitting there going, B -b 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 they just won the game two minutes in. I can't just call it. A and my decision to let them go through and still try to find Lord Nasilka and being terrified that they are miserable losers, 
because they, they can't find where the ceremonies happen. They can't find this demonic bastard. You know, they were sure they had just lost the game. And it was great. It was, and they, everyone had a big laugh at the end. And uh, it was just, it was great. Awesome. So just go with the flow, man. Th that's, that's why I love examples like that. And this is what I want this weather, no matter what the topic is, what I want this show, the rando stream to provide more and more of is exactly stuff like that. What you did, how you did it, what the result was, that was completely at there. So that when people watch this later on, you might be like, well, yeah, well, I would have done something different. That's great. You would have done something different, but we got the brain juices flowing now. Well, he was saying that. I was thinking, like, wouldn't it be fun if, it's, if you now turn the demon into completing the ritual to give himself power on this side of hell or, or, or Hades or whatever? Like, like there are so many things that you yes. can do as a game master. It just like he said, go with them. So awesome. Uh, so Baron, 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 how do you ensure pl the plot progresses at the right pace given the time constraints of a one shot? Well, it, there, it depends on if, if they are kind of like what, what Kevin said, you know, that weld will machine, you just let them progress. But the thing is, is that if you have a group of dugs, you know, ooh, squirrel, you know, <laughs> Um, you, what I like to do is I, what I call the red herring boomerang. Yes, they'll go after the red herring, but they'll still come back around because the red herring will still give them maybe some information to get them back on track. Just takes some because more time. It, it takes a little bit more time, but but you know the thing is 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 you know definitely you you know as I said you know point A point B how they get there is them. So you you have to work, you know, within your what what you're kind of set up, but you also have to be flexible and also be willing to let the let the players, not the characters, let the players find their way too. Because you know, you can grab them by their nose and drag them along, but it's but it's not going to necessarily get them to point B because, you know, they may decide, you know, that, you know, we're going to take out these, this infestation. Another thing I like to do is, you know, especially if it's like a, a zombie type outbreak type scenario is what I, what I have done is that I've actually turned one or two players into, you know, been bitten by a zombie. Which means that now they now they're on a time timer, and in order to stop it, they have to kill the big bad because or just shoot him in the head. Yeah, that too. <laughs> but 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 the way that I usually set them up is the progenitor is the one that if you take that out, it, it I, I kind of do a Dresden. I guess is the best way you. to put it. If you if you take out the oldest vampire, the rest of them are going to go. Because he's the progenitor. Same thing along the lines. If, but if they have not fully turned, then they're going to be fine. And you, you know, you give them that type. You know, and sometimes you have to give them those little extra nuggets to to you know get them to go that way too. Uh, or you know, the other one is to that I've done is that I've had you know maybe one of their their family, their wife, their son, you know, their daughter their grandma even, you know, has got, well, you know, we got to save granny, you know, Nana. <laughs> yeah, we got to save Nana. let's go, you know, and, and, and they're ready to rock and roll. And, you know, it, it, it is a lot of it's also, if you're, if you're do, like I said, if you're doing the one shot outside of a convention or that type of area, but if you're, you know what what is going to typically drive your players at the table to take action, and you know it, it's you know if you're if you've been playing with them long enough, you know what buttons to push to get them to go. And I mean, it, I mean, it, it, it's it, it's you know the typical type of you know with, with any GM. Once you learn your your 
the group that you're presenting your story to, then you can tell your story to the group. And a lot of times that will help you keep everything going. Okay. We've talked a bunch about, you know, effectively sandboxing or, you know, reacting to what's going on. You know, how do you have, I hate the word pacing. I don't know why I like, I don't like story story terms in my games, but, it, but they're, they're correct. How do you manage pacing so that the horror elements unfold naturally or organically without either feeling rushed or drawn out? It's tricky. You know, uh, again, you just kind of go with your gut and kind of adapt as you're going along. I also wanted to mention, you know, if, if your group, because I play with a lot of people I, I've never gamed with before. At, at the Palladium Open Houses and at conventions. Um, and, um, you know, some of them aren't real experienced role players and stuff. So even if you let them meander, because I'm, I'm a big fan of letting them kind of do their thing. And even if they're kind of meandering, there's no problem with, you got to remember, you're always in, at the Game Master. You're always in the control. You're the only one who knows what your story is. Is supposed to be they don't so you can make whatever tweaks and changes you want as you're going along and there's no reason you can't bring point b to them if they're, if they're that bad and, and they're so off track you could bring the big baddie to them under the premise of you guys have been doing this and you guys have been doing that and i know you're looking for me well, I don't like it, and I'm going to destroy you right now because it's annoying that I keep hearing about you guys, or you inadvertently foiled this plan of mine or that thing of mine, and now you're going to pay. And it's like, you still got the point B. They still get to fight the big baddie and hopefully survive <laughs> to tell the tale. And they don't know. All they know is they had fun mm -hmm. and that their actions brought the monster or the bad guy to them. And they were able to defeat it. Yay! There's nothing wrong with that. that that's fine. Sometimes, actually, actually, sometimes dropping, even early, dropping something on the players, it, it, it's not necessarily doing it prematurely, but if you're doing it to spur them on, yep. then to, to, to you, you may have decided well i'm i'm going to wait until act two to drop this on them but if they're kind of meandering around you know drop it early you know because number one horror is never you know you know if you if you're already building the tension and then you drop a horror the horror on them real super quick that's just going to add to it because then the further along they go they don't know when it's going to get dropped on them again. Yeah. Would you say so, that the so, trick is just keeping the tension up? Yeah. If the tension's already there, you can drop whatever you want anytime you want because that's just going to spike it. And and that's and that's the thing. You want to keep that ebb and, ebb and flow going and where you're just, you know, and sometimes you want to jump out there and scare the heck out of them. Sometimes you want them to, to be like, oh, well, there he is there. Let's go, you know. Sometimes, you know, it's not necessarily a, a when you're doing horror, it's not necessarily a bad time to drop anything. Right. And it could even be the big baddie, provided it gets away. And it's especially great if it kicks their butt and mocks them and then <laughs> disappears or runs off or whatever. And then they're like, we got to get that thing. No one, you know, it's the classic, no one hands me my own gun. You know, it's like, <laughs> Or tells me what to do, and it that's great because now they're highly motivated, and and they're looking for revenge, not just to save people. Only one man dares give me the raspberry. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else you guys want to say? Or are we ready to move on? Okay. So uh, next next topic is going to be on player characters and monsters. Before we go there, got a couple of chats to read. Uh, okay, I have one chat to read. Uh, Injun Joe said, I think in a horror game, it's essential to keep 
it unknown and spontaneous so the players are never prepared i want to add one thing to that it also helps keep the game master somewhat unprepared which i think can lead to some really fun spontaneous events Okay. Especially if you lean into it. Again, that's that's being flexible. The players yeah. do something that you didn't anticipate or is like freaking brilliant that you didn't anticipate. Go with it. You know, go with it. Brother Maddie, did you want to say something? or? Oh, no. No, okay. I was just, I, I'm in agreement. I am in agreement. I think it's, uh, I'll, I'm, th that's exactly right. That's exactly okay. Right. All righty then. Boop. The charity we support is the Wounded Warrior Project, a national nonpartisan organization whose mission is to honor and empower wounded warriors. Please refer to the video's description for a link to where you can make your hopefully tax-deductible donation. This has been by far, without exception, not even close, the worst year that we've had as far as charitable donations. So if you could, if you please can consider it, uh, donate to the Wounded Warrior Project through the link in the description. Also, we're going to have a Veterans Day 24-hour live stream. Heathen Dog is struggling to get people to play in his Paranoia second edition game. I don't understand that. So if that's something that might be of interest to you, of course, if you're watching this on video, it's probably already happened. But uh, please get a hold of us on our Discord to get a hold of Heathen Dog because he could really use some people and i could really use a nap during that 24-hour period so and of course if you enjoyed this discussion please like this video subscribe to all the panelists channels which you can find in the description